Hi, I'm Rich with Inside HPC. We're here at SC16 in Salt Lake City, and today I'm here with Anglin Go from SGI slash HPE. How are you doing this morning, sir? Fine, thank you. Well, it's great to meet you again. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's been a while since we talked, yes. but today I thought we could catch up because we've had this series of talks about big data and trends in high-performance computing. Yes. And, uh, well, what's, what's new on that front? Oh. Because I know a, mo a lot must have changed yes. in the recent... Yes? Uh, there are many things that are changing, but the two highlights right, uh, uh, on the HPC side is this renewed investment in energy efficiency, but not just in uh, the core, that's important, gigaflops per watt, but also the bigger picture of the PUE and the even bigger picture of the TUE, right, which is uh, more complete. And uh, for example, uh, at NASA, um, you know, they have a data center uh, solution, there's multi petaflops uh, of the order of a PUE of 1.26. But more recently, they installed one petaflop in a container outside that data center on a tarmac uh, that is uh, just measured to be 1.03 PUE. That's an amazing number from 1.26 to 1.03. And the operating cost savings is enormous. You know, they were talking about the savings of, uh, in terms of uh, energy bill, uh, 80%. And the savings of, in terms of water bill, uh, 99%. In California, this is important. 99%, mm. so uh, using a lot less water to do the same amount of computation. And a lot less electricity, yeah. yes. Yeah. So to them, uh, not just uh, the fact that it is lowering their operating cost, it is also, uh, um, the fact that it is in California where water is, uh, you know, there, there's a drought going on, yeah. yeah. So these kinds of developments with containers-based computing, uh, making that possible. And I know that, that when you make that jump, uh, you know, of, with PUE, right, one would be perfect, correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 So when, when you say uh, you have a PUE in a data center of 1.26, by the way, it is considered very good. In the old days, it used to be PUE of 2. By PUE of 1.26, it means that um, the burden of cooling your computer is 26% of the energy used to run the computer. So the burden is 26%, right, used to cool the computer. Uh, if you imagine that your, your PUE was 1.03, your burden rate is only 3%. You know, it, that's just amazing. Just when you think of uh, even the power conversion and things will take away that from you before you even start. Oh, yeah, precisely, yeah. precisely. Yeah. So even after the uh, power conversion uh, deductions and all, you add that extra 3%. Yeah? The way they do it uh, is also related to the uh, climate in California. Now it's not too humid, it's cool. So they essentially they just use fan power yeah, to suck in air into the what we call the modular data center, the container, uh, to cool the computer. Now if the temperature gets a bit too warm, right, uh, as a start, we already allow the computer to handle warm air, right? But if it gets still too warm, uh, we actually spray water onto the inlet uh, filter of the air coming in to get you that swamp cooler effect because the humidity is not too high. And that's why it's important now when we uh, discuss with customers, we don't just ask about the temperature, which really means the dry bulb temperature. We also ask about the wet bulb temperature then that tells you how much more you will get when you uh, use uh, spraying of that water, the swamp cooler effect. Okay, so what about the data side then? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, you remember the last time we spoke, I right. talked about the other side where after you get this uh, uh, simulation and HPC numerically intense pr producing lots of data, now on the analytics side, you have to take all that data and try to converge to a, uh, to a decision, to, a, to an insight, right? That's a, a data convergence problem. There you may also have your input, which is big, your function, and your solution. Now the, the issue is, in some of those cases where you're doing the analytics, you don't have the function. You don't have the Poisson equation and, and so on. For example, if you, uh, the goal was to try to identify cats in pictures, what is the equivalent of a Poisson or, or Navier-Stokes equation that will help you identify cats? No, we don't have that today. So, so in, in examples like neural networks, deep learning, that function is unknown. So what do we do? Well, 
we know that the inputs we know we have lots of cats pictures yeah. that we can label supervised learning and we know the solution because when it comes out and say this is a cat we can verify that they got it right so what do we do maybe we don't need the function the function needs just be an, be an adder and all we do is to split the input up into very very fine grain inputs of a picture of a cat fine grain inputs and then put importance levels to each of these inputs and that's what in neural network they call weights and the whole goal is to find the weights so once you have the weights essentially that's your function so, and then, so for example if it had fur that doesn't necessarily mean it's a cat that's right? Right. right so that's why you have to split that picture up into very very fine grain uh, pixels let's just yeah. say every pixels yeah. and then you will do deep, deep neural net means multiple layers yeah from a set of uh, identification they say these are fur another set of identification is these fur are uh, first, it's converging around, uh, hairs are converging around a circle of a certain shape. So it is more looking like a bird or a cat and so on, right? So deeper and deeper neural network, meaning more and more stages in that uh, inference, right? And ultimately, uh, you keep training it until it gets it right. You don't quite know uh, the function. All you get is a, is a set of weights in a matrix or tensors, that's why they call it tensor processing. Uh, weights, tensor, uh, uh, importance levels of the individual fine-grained uh, uh, portions of the input. Yeah. Now, can these kinds of uh, operations, like you just described, can that be done at scale? That's a great question. That's the next step, Yeah. right? So, for example, uh, NVIDIA has a DGX1, uh, eight GPUs in a server solution. That's a great solution, we've been selling them. Uh, to our customers. The key thing is uh, we have a customer that uh, uh, t was telling me they stack eight of these uh, three kilowatt uh, servers into a rack and then the data center couldn't handle it and the rack couldn't handle it. It would be a 30 kilowatt rack. So what we did for that and also for the Intel uh, processor that's coming up that does this kind of work, uh, not at 64 bit precision, double precision, not at uh, single precision, but also at half precision, right? right. Uh, these two processes from NVIDIA and from Intel, we are building a rack at scale to be able to take up to 79 kilowatts of power, right? And they will take blades that will have these processes in them. So we will have a, a scenario where we would be reselling uh, these, uh, what were almost looking like appliances, that help the customers get started in machine learning, neural network, and in multi-level neural network deep, uh, uh, deep learning. And when they need to go into production and scale it, we'll bring in the ICE XA that can handle uh, these up to 79 kilowatts uh, of power to be able to then take these CPUs and GPUs, uh, GP GPUs or CPUs that have uh, uh, half precision and scale them uh, inside our server. So almost like appliance to get the customer started, and uh, the ICE XA for scaling into production. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, power and cooling become the wall. We are back to the beginning again. <laughs> there we go. We're yeah. back in the beginning again. Yeah. So you first need to have enough uh, 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 infrastructure that can have, handle enough power, yeah. right? Yeah. If you, because you want to put lots of them in there. Why is uh, uh, training uh, why, why do you need to scale training? Well, training can take days. Question is, does the customer want to bring it down to minutes? Are there customers that bring it down to seconds to be able to train quickly a new scenario and then infer quickly, right? These are the kinds of things. When you need to get that kind of performance, you would go to that scaled uh, solution. Yes, and, but once you do that, the next question is, uh, can you do it efficiently because I'm consuming too much power? Once you make it efficient at the gigaflop per watt or number of uh, 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 train instances per, per watt right in neural network. Uh, the, the question is then, uh, once you, you gigaflops per watt or train instances per watt, uh, you get that efficient. Next question is then, can I cool it efficiently? Not just run it efficiently, but can I cool it efficiently? And this is where the PUE uh, discussion uh, comes in as we did uh, at the beginning of this interview. So England, it seems like this is the supercomputing that's all about AI, artificial intelligence. But that's not a new technology. It's been around for, for decades, yes. right? Is this just a flash or, or, or is this for real? 
I think I think it's uh, quite real, right? Uh, for two reasons. One, um, compute power has got powerful and low cost enough for us to be able to to train to a degree that the infer inference uh, is uh, is practical, right? So there's lots of compute power and lots of data handling. In fact, that's an even tougher problem. Uh, taking in massive amounts of data to be able to handle that amount of data uh, to do that training. Right? So that's the first thing. Uh, and we are, we are there today, right? Today with uh, GP GPUs and the new processor from Intel, right? Uh, at, at the precision uh, that is just good enough, right? Uh, half precision. The other area that I believe uh, is, is emerging and, and the scientists and engineers are thinking seriously about is as follows. In the old days, we're talking hundreds of years ago, uh, scientists have a theory and then they run experiments as the big, uh, big foundation of theory to verify that the uh, experiment, to verify that the theory is correct. Right? And then decades ago, we came up with uh, computers that could do the simulation to verify that the theory is correct or incorrect. Right? And simulation, the HPC industry can be proud of themselves to have brought up simulation to a level that in, in some cases has taken over experiment in verification, right? Like uh, virtual prototyping of, of an aircraft uh, without ever having to build a first uh, the physical prototype. The first aircraft built is a, is a production aircraft, right? So, so the HPC industry can be proud of bringing simulation in some instances to the level of uh, of experiment. So that's the uh, tripartite, right? Theory verified by experiment, theory verified by uh, simulation. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, there are some cases where uh, experiment is still paramount, like Nobel Prizes. I heard, re uh, you know, I, I learned recently that uh, uh, no matter how well believed by your peers, your theory are, even if simulation proved you right, uh, you won't be, uh, you won't get your Nobel Prize until an experiment's prove you right. Yeah. Anyway, I digressed. So there's this, there's this uh, uh, triangle, right? I, but I believe there is a, a third uh, uh, foundation coming up, and that's inference, inference from a machine learning, right? Why I say that? Well, the customers I talk to are starting to, to think perhaps, if my input function and solution and all the equations I've been using here is starting to get a bit too complex because of different multidiscipline, too complex. Can I then use the inference approach, machine learning approach and infer the solution? They are even now thinking in some cases of trying out machine learning instead of using the equations they are uh, so uh, used to and uh, familiar with. So. Now, inference for the scientific uh, simulation, right, and engineering simulation is not quite there, but I believe uh, in this triangle, uh, it is starting to be thought of as perhaps it could be, right? And over the years, I think it will start to rise. It may take a while to reach that same level, I think, but uh, it is rising. You know, this, this is fascinating to me because, as you said, we've created these algorithms, right, to come out with an explicit uh, output, right? We spent a lot of time doing that. Right. I'm trying to get, make sure the equations are right. Yeah. Make sure they, they convert into the right partial differential equations. Make sure we run the simulation, they converge. But once we get the answer, uh, we know it is based on, you know, well understood uh, uh, equations, right? Yeah. Give you an example. When Google AlphaGo uh, AI software recently won over the world top Go player, uh, the developer of AlphaGo was interviewed, right? And he was asked this question. Why did AlphaGo make this particular move that won the game? You know, the answer really got me thinking, right? You know what the developer said? I don't know. He didn't know, he didn't know how it came to that conclusion. Yeah, right, because uh, the machine has, has gone way past us. We developed it to learn. It kept on learning on its own. Right? Yeah. We, of course, controlled the, the inputs and it learned through supervised learning. But we also gave it reinforcement learning where we took two instances of the AI software and, and uh, worked on each other. And then after some time, it has just gone past us. So all you end up with in the end is a set of weights and, and 
and the weights just tells you whatever inputs, set of inputs comes in, this one more important, this one less, and so on, right? And we don't quite uh, know, that as, according to the developer, we don't quite know why it made that move. So it makes you think. It really does, because I, I think about the first time I talked to anybody about artificial intelligence was a, a NASA language called CLIPS. And it was all explicit, and it was about rules, right? Yes, uh, knowledge base. So, yeah. yeah, in AI software in the early uh, a few decades ago when it got started, uh, the focus was on expert systems and rules. Essentially, but it means rules base. If you want to emulate uh, uh, an expert that can make decisions based on what he or she, she sees, he or, she, uh, he or she sees, uh, uh, you, you, are, you interview that expert and say, why do you make this decision? If you see this, do this. If you see that, do that, and so on. Then you write that all down and you write your if, if statements, mm -hmm. right? And that becomes your, your expert system. That was a rule-based system. In this uh, new, uh, or rather newly emerging, re-emerging uh, way of doing uh, AI, Right? Uh, it is based on inference after learning. Very much like humans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we start out young and then we, we learn. Yeah. And then as we learn, hopefully we get intelligent, right? And then once we become intelligent, hopefully we are given autonomy. And that's, you see that machine learning, once the machine is, has learned, it is given uh, you know, artificial intelligence, it gets artificially intelligent. And then once it's artificially intelligent, you give it aut uh, autonomy, like an autonomous vehicle, right? So very much like humans, yeah. But the thing is, as we take uh, to, 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 to co complete college, right? How many years do we need? Uh, 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 six plus four, 10, 12, 15, I don't know, 15, 20 years uh, plus postgraduate degree. Yep. Learning is a long process. Same way machine learning is a long process. That's why you are right right uh, in asking the question about scaling, right? Because uh, a learning process um, with massive input, big data inputs, right? Yeah. Uh, like not just 100 pictures of cats, but millions, 10 million, 100 million pictures of cats, say, right? right? You are talking um, days, right, to learn. But if you need that learning to be quick, imagine, you know, someone in grade school go in and five minutes later, he graduates, right? he or she graduates, right? you scale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can't really scale humans that way, right? But uh, machine, you can scale. And that's uh, our job, right? Well, England, this is you know, fascinating. I love to keep talking about it, especially about the cars and everything that are coming. But maybe we should revisit that in about six months. What do you yeah. say? Yeah, we, we keep uh, getting updated uh, every six months and see where the trends are going and uh, whether whether we have to correct ourselves, if we, you know, it's hard to predict things, yeah. or that uh, we reinforce what we said before, because, uh, oh, we realize that he has now gone into production, for example. 